So without further ado, it is my honor to kind of be bringing the third installment of a series we've called The Way. The way is simply a term that the early church called following Jesus. They called it kind of the way. And so we want to continue to unpack that uh, in kind of some of those countercultural ways uh, of the world and be able to show like God has called us to be, uh, to give his redemptive hope. We are beacons of light. We are his, his regents, if you will, his ambassadors in the world to shine the light of Christ to a world who is desperately looking for answers. Can I get an amen? All right, let's pray before we dive in. Father, we love you. We honor you. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to speak to us. Father, we know that every time we open your word, it's an opportunity for you to read us, God, that your word has a way of permeating any any places in our lives, Father, that you want to bring us into wholeness. And so, Father, we ask you, Lord, we give you permission today. Search our hearts, God. God, encourage us to take the next step in you today, Father. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, today I have entitled the message, if you are a note taker, Redemptive Hope. And we are going to be looking at the story of the Apostle uh, Paul, who was is, is one of his names, his Greco-Roman name was actually Saul of Tarsus. And so we know in this culture, it's not uncommon that you would have two names. In fact, that was one name, and then Paul was his Hebrew name. And so we he has an incredible conversion story that we are going to kind of read through, and we are going to extract what I think are three really really important critical steps if we are going to follow the ways of Christ. So read with me Acts 9, 1 through 9 is where we're going to start. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogue in Damascus so that if he found anyone who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. So we know that Saul was uh, not only, he was Jewish by birth, but he was also kind of, he was in a Roman, uh, he was a Roman citizen because he was born in a province that Rome ruled. And so we know that Saul actually knew, he knew, uh, you know, authority really well. Not only was he kind of brought up in kind of a religious upbringing and Jewish culture and teaching, but he was also very familiar with kind of the control and command situation that Rome ruled with. And so he's very familiar with uh, with authority. In fact, we know that he possessed a religious zeal for Jewish law. In fact, some scholars actually believe that he was on his way to the Jewish Supreme Court. So he was kind of on his way. And right about this time, he also was at, some believe that he was actually at the stoning of the first Christian martyr, which was Stephen. And so some believe that he was actually there cheering it on and, and, and being, yes, this is what we need to do. So right after that, he goes on kind of a, a zealous rampage of like, we are going to take out the Christians. Men, women, throwing them in prison. He was known for killing Christians at the time. And so this is kind of where we're picking up this story to give you some context. We know that he, is, he encounters Jesus in such a radical way with a blinding light that he actually goes blind for three days. And Jesus tells him, the same guy, the same guy that was just persecuting all the Christians who believed in Jesus has encountered Jesus, and he's now listening to him, right? He's complying with what Jesus has told him to do. He says, go into the city. In fact, if we're going to live this out, if we're going to live out the way we are going to have to do the same that Saul did. And he learned obedience. That is point number one, if you are a note taker, is obedience. In fact, Webster defines obedience as submissiveness to the restraint or command of authority. A willingness to comply. Well, why, did he com- why, why would he comply to the, the very man, the very the, the Christians believed in? Why would he all of a sudden comply and go with Jesus? And I would propose that for the first time, he actually encountered a relationship, an intimate relationship. In fact, Jesus calls him by name. Saul, Saul, what are you doing? What are you doing? He knows him intimately. In fact, 1 John 4 tells us that God is love. You know, love will make you do some crazy things. Can I get it? I mean, has anybody experienced this? You're like, what am I doing? 
Because love has a way of capturing our heart and leading us in ways that we would have never imagined. And I believe that's what happened to Saul. He, he encountered love. He didn't encounter authority before. He clearly knew what that meant. But he, he, he encountered an authority that came from Jesus in, 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 in Jesus' love. So we know he encountered love firsthand. And this is where he begins to comply. In fact, John 15, 9 through 11 says it this way, that just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Jesus is a lover. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. How many know there's joy in surrender? There's joy in obedience, and none of us like it. I mean, let's just, let's just be honest for a minute. I mean, the word obey, kind of like you cringe a little bit. You're like, that's for children, right? <laughs> but the reality is God calls us the children of God. He calls us the children of God because he loves us so much that he would lead us in such a way. He's like, hey, I need you to trust me with your life and obey my commandments because I have what is best, even if you can't see the end from the beginning. Aren't you glad? John is saying obedience flows from a loving relationship with Christ. As a parent, my kids, man, there's a difference. When they obey, they're like, okay, mom, uh, and the roll of the eyes. That one really gets me. But when there's like a yes, mom, right, from a loving there, a posture, man, it's like totally different. And there is a difference in all the parents said. Amen. Come on. When we yield in marriage, Love compels us to do crazy things, right? Yes, I, I'll do the laundry. I'm doing cooking. And this goes both ways, by the way. So Mr. Burroughs is actually the better cook. And yes, I said that in the 1115 service than me. Um, but you do things, right? You pick, up the, you pick up after the kids. You clean the bathroom. You do the things, right? Why? Love compels us for one another. We put other people's needs in front of our own. Why? Because love compels us. It calls us to do crazy things. We also know that Saul knew what dutiful obedience is because religion requires a dutiful response, much like my kids give me a lot of times. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 we got to get to the heart. Like, we got to get to the heart of the thing, right? Religion says, I have to go to church. Relationship says, I get to worship with the ecclesia. That means that is the, the church of Jesus. I get to come into his presence with thanksgiving, and I get to worship and be transformed in God's presence together. We're the, we're the called out ones. Do you know that's what that means? That's what the church is. We're the called out ones, right, who are following the way of Jesus. How exciting is that? Religion says I should read my Bible, but relationship says, oh, man, I can't wait to hear what Jesus has to say to me today. I can't wait to see where he leads me today. Religion says I should pray. Love, relationship, says I get to talk to Jesus. I get to talk to my father because Jesus made a way for me to have direct access to the creator of the universe. Who knows me by name. Who called me out in my mother's womb and he called you out in your mother's womb contrary to what popular belief is talking about. He had, you, he had you wired in. He had you just the way you are, right? All your rough edges and everything, God had you in mind. Religion says, I should forgive. Relationship and love says, man, those that love much, they forgive much. I don't know about you, but I need some forgiveness in my life. I'm the only one person. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. I know it's good to know I'm not alone. There are a lot of times that we do a lot of shouldas. Shouldas, I should do this, I should do this, I have to do this. May I propose to you that if we'll focus on loving Jesus and allowing his love to transform us from the inside, we go from shoulda to I get to. I, I, get, I get to come alongside of Jesus and what he's doing in the earth and I get to love people and I get to serve people and, and this love transforms us. It transforms us into the image of Christ. You know, I'm not faithful to my husband, Jeremy, out of duty. I'm faithful because I love him. When, we say, when I said yes to Jeremy, I said no to all other lovers. When we say yes to Jesus, we say no to all other lovers. 
We say, Jesus, you're the most important thing to me. Jesus, you are the most important thing, and I'm going to put you first in all of my life, and everything else is going to get prioritized under that because I know that your word tells me, Matthew 6, I love simple things, right? When it gets too complex for me, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What is the simple thought? Here is the simple thought. Matthew 6, Jesus says this, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto us. He says, hey, hey, I know you're worried about that thing the other day. It, it happened to me even just this week. I was, my head, I was in my head. Does anybody else get in their head sometimes? And I'm over here, and he's like, hey, 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 Christina, Christina, Matthew 6, I need you to just focus here. Focus on this relationship right here, and I want you to seek first my kingdom, and all this other stuff's going to work itself out. And the same is true for you today. You walked in today thinking, man, there's all kind of things going on in your mind, and you're thinking, well, what if this and what if that? He says, hey, 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 I've made it simple. Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and I will, everything else is going to come and it's going to align, but I need you to obey me in this one thing. Can you obey me in this one thing? I need you to come to me and give me all of the things that are worrying your mind. Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Aren't you glad? You know, we've talked about this before, even in the soul care series, that a lot of our anxieties actually come because we're leaning not on his ways, we're leaning on us. Can we just be honest in this church? <laughs> come on. I, come on. You can keep, on, keep that up. <laughs> we lean on our own selves. He says, no, trust me. I need you to lean on me. Let me simplify it for you. I need you to obey my word. My word says, seek me first, and all this other stuff is going to work itself out. You know, mainstream culture often paints faith as a religion without a name. You fill in the blank. Transformation only happens through relationship with a person, and his name is Jesus. There is a difference. There is a difference. You know, Jesus is our foundation is one of our values here at, at Catalyst Church. You've probably seen it on a pop-up banner somewhere. Wherever we pop up, there it is, right? And so the reason we do that is because we know that if we'll put Jesus as our foundation, then everything else, our lives can be built upon it. That's why order matters so much. It is so important. When you start to feel anxious, you're trying to figure out your own ways. You have to go back, God, am I obeying you first? What was the first thing you told me to do? Oh, yes, seek first the kingdom of God. And in, in, in your righteousness, and I'll add everything else unto you. Oh, oh yes, Jesus. Have you ever noticed that, that you don't have to teach children disobedience? Hello. Hello. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, it's like, no, don't touch that. You will burn your, your, your hand. Like, no, you cannot have ice cream for breakfast. No, never, actually. You will be hanging off the rafters. Like, no, no, you cannot do that. You need to put on shorts, my son, you, it is 20 degrees outside, and you will be very, very cold, right? It's like, no, 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 because we're like, no, we're going to do it our own way. We now have a dog who is also learning that. I'm like, no, you cannot use my rug as your toilet. No, you are not going to put your paws on the table and eat like a human. No, right? We we're, we're just naturally want to do things our own way. And it, it requires discipline, and it requires obedience is learned, right? It's not, doesn't come innate to us. Just because we say yes to Jesus, it takes, it takes discipline to say, God, I am going to put you first, and I, I am determined in my life. I have made this determination, and I submit it to you. It might be a good one for you as well. There is joy in surrender, there is joy to be found in obedience, but you got to get first, you got to get past the, the first couple times, right? Because it's like, oh, there is nothing in me that wants to submit in this way to you. <laughs> or it's just me. I'm being real transparent with you guys. But once you do, you realize there's joy in surrender. There's a release. There's peace. There's peace that passes all understanding because I know that you care for me. You love me so much. He loves us, church. He loves us so much. Joyce Meyer says, obedience to God is the pathway to the life you really want to live. And we spend so much time resisting him. <laughs> when he's like, he's like, hey, follow, this is the path, this is the way. And we're like, no, we'd rather do it ourselves. He's like, I'm trying to actually short circuit so you don't have to go around, you don't have to get lost and get rerouted a couple times. I'm trying to take you to the quickest path from point A to point B. It's called obedience. It's called obedience. Try to tell my children that. They are still not getting it. You know, some believe Paul was just too evil. He's too evil. He's too far gone. He's killing Christians. 
How could God possibly use a person like that? Can I tell you that culture today, let's take, culture today is like a child testing limits. We are testing all kind of limits. We are seeing how far can we push the envelope that relies on us. Can I tell you, there is a better way. There is a better way. And as believers, if I can talk to the Christians for just a moment in the room, if you have said yes to Jesus, we've got to live this thing out. We've got to learn to be obedient to the ways of God so that we can show a different way to a culture that is running itself in the ground on every kind of issue. There are no pet issues. It's all kind of issues that we think that we know best. Come on. This is a place, church, where God is calling us, hey, hey, children, it is time to step into the gap. I need you to step into the gap, but it starts with us. Romans 5, 20, 21 says, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. What does this mean? This means that where there is sin, grace abounds all the more. Where some people wrote Saul off, he says, where sin abounds, hello, he was persecuting Christians, throwing them in jail and killing them. Grace abounded all the more. And look at what the Lord does. We're not even done with the story. But he has said, no, you're not counted out. In fact, I'm just rerouting you to repurpose you for the very thing that I put in you from birth. These are the things I've called you to. There's some of you in the room today, God's rerouting you to remind you today, hey, there's gifts, there's talents, there's things that I've put inside you, but it's contingent upon your obedience. It's contingent upon your obedience, not in like a legalistic way or religious way. It's like, hey, I have what's best for you, but I need you to trust me with my ways. I need you to trust me. I tell my kids this all the time. I'm like, will you just trust me? Trust your mama. I know, I know how, and you are wearing yourself out. If you'll just take a rest, I have good, good plans on the other side of your rest. And all the parents said amen again. Sorry, uh, lots of parent, uh, <laughs> parent. There's a lot of parenting that goes on in our life right now. No one is ever too far out of reach. In fact, John 15, 13 through 14 says, Greater love has no one than this, that one would lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. In other words, John is saying like, hey, it, obedience comes out of loving relationship and submitting ourselves to God, not because we have to, because we want to. And when we don't want to, we have to remember, man, God loves me so much. He must know something I don't know. He must know something that I don't know. And it's worth the wait. In what way is God calling you in way of obedience, church? We all have a next step. We do. I, we all do. I do. We all do. And, and, and the reality is God is putting his finger on a few areas that come to mind today. And I want you to, to say, God, God, what are those ways that you're asking me to obey you more fully? Maybe you've given him a little bit. He wants the whole thing. He wants you to try Matthew 6, out because his return on investment is good. He's like, hey, I need you to put all of it on this. I need you to put your weight on this. My word will not come back void. If we're going to follow the ways of Jesus, the next step that it's going to require is a step in toward, towards freedom. Towards freedom. Let's pick back up in Acts chapter 9, 10 through 19. I know I'm reading a lot of scripture today. I know the, the word of God speaks. <laughs> and, and I would encourage you to even go back this week. This is your challenge this week. Go back and read this passage for yourself. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judah on Straight Street. Ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. I would be scared too, wouldn't you? But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and he entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as, as you were coming here has sent me to you to, 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 that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell off from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. That is radical. That is radical. 
God, the first thing he does after Saul makes a decision to know God in, in, this, in this intimate way, he literally puts him in community immediately. He says, hey, I'm sending you a guy named Ananias. And Ananias was also on a journey of trusting God and obedience too because he's like, uh, are you sure about that? Do you know that guy? Like, we've been hiding from him, and you are now sending me to him? Like, are you sure about this? Right? Can I, can, has God ever it just it prompted you to do something that you're like, are you sure about this? Right? This is the way of God sometimes. <laughs> and he says, okay, like, I'm going to go. And then we even see he ends up calling him brother, which means, to me, this is the fruit of obedience. You've gone from calling him a murderer to now calling him a brother. This is a transformation process because he was scared of him. And now he's saying, yes, God, I'm going to be. So Ananias was growing in his own faith in this way. He was saying, okay, I trust you. I'm going to lay hands on this guy, and he's going to become my brother. How powerful. This is how we're supposed to live, church. God is calling us to be, to actually go to the Saul's and be the Ananiases. Can I tell you that sometimes we, we can have a lot of low grace for people and a culture that is far from God. But can I tell you, we are primed in a day where God's about to do some turnaround stories. He is about to do some turnaround stories because just like Saul had it a little bit twisted, right? He's using his own strengths for his own purposes the way he thought. But God says, oh, no, 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 no. No, that's not what I intended at all. I actually have intended to push you forward. And that is exactly what God is going to do in this generation, church. I believe it with all of my heart. In your life, the things that the enemy caused to, to take you out, he's going to turn it around so that you become a living testimony. How, do we, how, how does the gospel advance? Well, we know that we overcome by the blood of the lamb. That's what Jesus did. He made it possible. And then guess what? We overcome by the word of our testimony. So he puts them in a small group <laughs> with Ananias. He gets some Christian friends around him because he's like, hey, you got some rough edges. I know you just came to Jesus, but whoa, don't cut me, right? He's got some rough edges. You have some rough edges. I have some rough edges. The only way the rough edges get worked out is when iron is sharpening iron. And we are in close community. And you know where he starts? Right at home. He starts in your apartment with your roommate. He starts with your spouse. He gave you those kids to sharpen you too, mom and dad. I got sharpened just this week, and I said, whoa, Lord, I'm listening. I am listening. That's why he does it. He puts us in community because we weren't created to do life alone. You're going to hear it so many times at Catalyst. In fact, I'm pretty sure every time that we, we talk, we somehow talk about it, taking the mask off. Why? Because we know that James 5, 16, everybody, if you know it, say it with me. Come on. I'm going to do old school. Confess your sins one to another, and you will be healed. Yes, Jesus heals you. That's the decision. Yes, you are now in the kingdom of God, and he has washed away your sins. But can I tell you something? We don't begin to walk in layers of freedom until you get into community and take your mask off and start confessing your sins one to another so that you can be healed. It's God's process of freedom. It's his process of freedom. Some of you are in community groups, and you still haven't taken the mask off. Can I challenge you this week? Just one or two. You may not need to do it with the whole group, but you got to take it off to somebody. Hey, I'm struggling here. Hey, this is something that's it's weighing me down. We, we, this is the way of freedom, church. And we can't get free all by ourselves. So Jesus does that. He puts him right into community almost immediately. Is there somebody in your life that you've written off, that you think is too far gone and you've stopped praying? There have been people in my life where I'm like, oh, I just don't know, Lord. If I'm, can I be honest? We have any honest people? in this room. And yet, just like Ananias, he's like, hey, Christina, I need you to get your faith up because you don't know what I'm about to do with this person. You don't know what I'm about to do in this culture. You don't know what I'm about to do. So I need you to get eyes of faith and I need you to get freer so that you can see what I see. This is what I see in this person. I need you to see with eyes of faith, not your fears. Ananias saw with eyes of fears, he's going to kill me, Jesus. <laughs> he's like, no, he's not. You're a part of the plan. You're going to lay hands on this guy, and he's going to walk out and become a fireball for Jesus. And we know later that he absolutely did. He's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he is baptized, and he goes on his way. In fact, this process of freedom, there's a term that we call spiritual formation. 
And this is the journey. We call it a spiritual journey here at Catalyst. All of us are on it. We're on different stops on the metro rail, right? You got on, God's got, and it's all different for each of us. We're all very different because it, 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 he created us differently on purpose, which also rubs us the wrong way, right? It's like if everybody was just like me, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm really glad people are not like me, I promise. Um, but spiritual formation is defined as the process of being formed in the image of Christ, a journey not becoming persons of compassion, persons are, are into becoming persons of compassion, persons who forgive, persons who care deeply for others and the world, persons who offer themselves to God to become agents of divine grace. We are agents of divine grace in the lives of others, and their world in brief, persons who love and serve as Jesus did. Um, author and theologian Robert Mulholland uh, termed, what, what is this process? He tries to sum it up. We are on a journey, and how many know we are going to be on that journey till we see Jesus face to face? So nobody's exempt, none of us. We, have, we all have a next step to take in this area of freedom. In fact, he goes on, uh, Paul, who later writes, so the same Paul that has this conversion experience, in Ephesians 1, 18 and 19, he writes, I pray that the eyes of your hearts may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? This phrase, eyes of your heart may be enlightened, actually is talking about our spiritual sight. That's why in verse 19, scales, what is like scales fall off of his eyes because we can't see clearly yet. And every, with every layer that we take off of our hurts, our hangups, our, our issues, right? If you missed any of the soul care series, please go back and listen to it because a lot of that is unpacked in those series. But it's allowing God into the recesses of our hurt, our pain, our memories, all the bad experiences, all the things. Because if we don't, we're kind of jaded, we can't see correctly, and only through the power of the Holy Spirit can that be lifted off of us. But this is God's heart for us. In fact, Aristotle, a fourth century Greek philosopher you all know, he actually called the heart the seat of your emotion, and it actually directs a lot of life. The Bible also says this, Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Did you know that your heart has eyes? You can't see until you can see. You can see with your eyes when you can see with your heart. And God wants to do, he is in the miracle working business. He is a great heart surgeon. Come on, thank you for that. Come on, he's a great heart surgeon. And can I tell you that uh, my doctor, my, my doctor, my friend, Dr. Julie Geddes, actually, she said something to me about a decade ago, and it continues to resonate in my heart. And it says that God does not reveal anything that he doesn't want to heal. What does that mean? Any good doctor will tell you if you don't get the thing out, you can't heal, right? If you have a wound, you need to get whatever the foreign object or the, the, the skewed perspective out so that you can heal fully and you can see with your heart. You can see with your heart. And then he begins to work on your eyes because then you can see. Oh, man, Saul, you have no idea. You are about to become the Apostle Paul who is going to write 13 books of the New Testament. You are going to pioneer three missionary journeys, and those journeys are going to take you to Asia and Europe, and it's going to flip the world upside down. And by the way, you're going to raise up some mentors, mentees that are going to go forth and do even greater things. God has a great plan and a purpose for us, church. And for all of us, we are all missionaries on this journey of allowing God to do the work on the inside of us so that we can go into the highways and the byways, the schools, government positions, doctor's offices, businesses, and we can shine the light of Jesus in a way that is attracted to say there is redemptive hope. This is not all there is. And aren't you glad, church? Aren't you glad? You know, I wear contacts, which I have on right now, and glasses. And anytime there's a smudge on the glasses or if I have something going on with my contact lenses and it's irritating me, I literally can't see. <laughs> and so the same is true for us. When we don't allow our issues to get exposed to the light of Jesus, it blurs our vision. 
It's going to be really hard to see our neighbor and what God has called someone else to do when we can't even see ourselves. So God wants to give us some new lenses. He wants to upgrade your prescription. I had to do that turning 40 plus. That's, from now on, I'm 40 plus. That is it. He had to upgrade my prescription so I could see better. Nothing's changed or so I thought. Life happens. Life happens. We got to get really good at cleaning our lenses. In fact, I remember when I dedicated my, my heart to Jesus as a young adult. And I came uh, back from, I literally, God had to chase me down. Because I was determined in my own strength to find my own way. And he was like, yeah, I have a different plan for you. And he chased me down. And I was not blinded by a light. But I certainly did have undeniable encounters in which I said, yes, God, you got my attention. Right? I can relate to, to Saul in this way. And as I'm on this journey, I come back to my local church. What does God do? He puts me in community immediately. And I'm like, I don't really want to do that with them. And he's like, you're going to do that with them because you need it. And they need you too. So I did, submitted myself to the process. It wasn't easy. And let me tell you, I wasn't easy to love. I mean, I know y'all can't see it, but I was a little sassy. <laughs> and I was very hard to lead. I'm not going to lie. I, wanted, I thought I knew best. That's ugly. I didn't know it then. I know it now, nearly 20 years later. I was like, okay, I, I probably could have had a little bit more humility, right? I could have listened more, talked less. I could have, you know, there were a lot of things about me that were rough edges. They still are. Hello, God gave you a personality, and you do have some weaknesses and blind spots, and so that's another reason we need community, to help us stay in our strength zone most of the time. But I also know that God loves to work in our weakness because then he shows himself strong. That is not fun, and that will build humility in a heartbeat. And so I submit myself to my young adult pastor in this way, and he's like, you got to need to be in community. And, you know, and I thank God because I look back on that season. He was an Ananias in my life. He laid hands on me and said, girl, you are called to this. I didn't see it. I didn't see it at the time. I'm so glad that he had done the work that he needed to do so he could see what God was doing in my own life. And I am so sure that when I gave him a little bit of attitude, he was like, are you sure about this one, Jesus? I don't, I don't know. Can you work with this one? <laughs> Same is true for you. Can you thank God for some Ananiases in your life that have come alongside of you even in your rough edges when you were like, I'm going to cut you, right? And he was like, no, 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 no. We're not going to cut anybody. <laughs> we're going to promote love in Jesus' name, right? God is so good and he's so gracious and he's so patient with us. Can we be patient with each other? Can we be patient with those who come around a little rough-edged? Can we make room for some people who need to know the love of Jesus in a generation who's looking for him in all the wrong places? Can we make room? Can we make room? The Apostle Paul, the, the, the same one who was killing Christians, he says this. I think he, he has some authority on the issue. Galatians 5, 16 and 17, but I say walk by the Spirit. We notice he was filled with the Holy Spirit. That is the way that empowers us to walk this out. And you will not carry out the desire of the flesh anymore. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. Come on, obedience doesn't always mean that you want to do it. But man, I trust you, Jesus. And I love you so much. And I know at the end of the day, you love me too. And you have the end from the beginning. And you know the best place to get there. And you want to save me some heartache and some mistakes that are not necessary. But it takes obeying. So what's your next step in this freedom journey for yourself? We all have one to take. I would encourage you, ask God, God, search my heart. Are there lies I'm believing about you? Are there lies I'm believing about your character? Am I not seeing correctly? Would you adjust my lenses? You can do it. If we're going to walk this thing out, we're going to have to take the third step, and that's the step towards purpose. In fact, Acts 9, 20 and 20 through 22, read with me. Saul spent several days with his disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished, and they asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc? in Jerusalem, among those who call on his name. And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners uh, to the chief priest? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Aren't you grateful for some redemptive hope? 
What you think has disqualified you has actually qualified you all the more because of Jesus' grace. He's got so much grace. Where sin abounds, grace all the more, church. I have found that the very areas that you feel the most disqualified are typically, uh, let's call them clues into what the enemy is trying to contort and pervert. Because that's the very area that God has anointed you to step in and be the light in somebody else's life as well. Because oftentimes we disqualify ourselves in our weakness. We disqualify ourselves in the areas that we struggle with. But God's saying, that's the area that I've anointed you to go forth and be a light. Showing that it's not in of yourself. It's, it's me. It's me. One of our overseers, Dr. Mark Batterson, he wrote a book called Win the Day. He says, your destiny is hidden in your history. I'm going to read that again. Let me just let that sink in for a second. Because when I read it, I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Your destiny is hidden in your history. What does he mean by that? There are clues all, the way, all, all along the way. If you'll take the time to reflect and look back, God, where were you? God took this, I'm about to get to it. He took my skills and my talents as he wants to with you and the things that maybe you didn't use for his glory and he wants to turn it around and he wants to use it for his glory as he did with Saul. Saul was zealous for the things of God. He just had it a little, you know, a little misguided. He, this same guy with the zealousness that he had, he was about to turn around this guy with zeal and grit and he was going to have to face shipwreck and prison, and beatings, and all the other things. God was using that grit. So maybe the things that you thought were, were a hindrance to you, God was saying, oh, no, 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 you're just using them in the wrong way. Let me make some adjustments to your lenses so you can see the power and the plan that I have for you, that I actually had for you in your mother's womb. You just didn't see it. You, you, you thought that, that job was insignificant. You thought those people were insignificant. You thought that that situation was the end of you. No, it was just the beginning. Because you had the grit to get up. And here's what my Bible tells me. That the good, that God has good things planned for those. And he turns everything, even the bad things, around for his good. If it's not good yet, he is not done. Look, look in your history for the hidden treasure. He's got clues for you all along the way. As a young 21-year-old girl, this was about what I was about to tell you guys. I, I discovered uh, I went on a cruise ship because I thought that uh, I didn't want to be in business or in the fluorescent lights. They gave me a headache. So I was like, uh uh no, 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 I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something totally radical and different. And so I, to my amazement, got a job as a cruise director on a tall ship in the middle of the Caribbean. It's completely random. My parents were like, what are you doing? And I was like, I don't know, but I'm going to find out. And so I aboard, this sh- I aboard this ship, and what I discovered about myself was a couple things. I discovered some good things. God had put some gifts on the inside of me. I could organize people really well, and I could move them towards things. And at the time, I thought it was like, oh, yeah, my destiny is to make sure people have a great time. You are got to be fun if you are, get a cruise director job, okay? So my kids often say, like, Mom, are you sure? Like, are you, have you ever been fun in your life? And I'm like... Oh, girl, you do not even know. Your mama was fun, and I'm still fun. I'm having to rediscover it in this season. Thank you, Dr. Sylvia. She knows I'm fun. I got some fun. She's like Dr. Fun, Dr. Fun over here. (laughs) Anyways, I'm on this ship, and I am, uh, this pastor actually came aboard, who I did not know was a pastor at all, had no clue. He comes up to me, and he says, hey, hey, um, he comes with his wife, and he's like, hey, I I keep having this picture of you. And this picture is that you are like a, like a pot that's been cracked. And he's like, and God says that he wants to actually put you back together into the original form that he had for his purposes. And, you know, after I got over the offense, I was curious. <laughs> and I was like, ah, oh, okay. So I wrote it in my journal. In fact, I drew a picture of it. I still have it to this day. And I said, huh, okay. I had no clue what he was saying was actually biblical. And I wonder if 
Paul, same way, was kind of, you know, Ananias begins to come alongside of him and see, like, this, this, this broken pot just needs to be repurposed. That's all. And it reminded me of a scripture in Jeremiah 18, 1 through 4. It says, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as it seemed best to him. Now, Paul actually goes on to call us jars of clay. He calls us, as, as human beings, jars of clay. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, But we have the treasure in jars of clay to show the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. So what does this mean? This means that God has put talents, gifts, abilities, and unique markings, like I tell my kids all the time, no one else in the whole world has your thumbprint. That's pretty cool. On you. But because of life and sin and wounds and hurts and all the things, sometimes we just need to get back on the potter's wheel. We just need to say, God, here I am. Form me, mold me, make me. If there's any adjustments you need to make, have at it because I trust you to do it. I obey you in this because I know that you love me so much and you have the end goal in mind. And here I've been trying to find purpose all by myself. Even though I grew up in church all my life and knew Jesus, I thought I had to figure it out myself. Maybe there's some people in the room that you've been trying to figure out, God, what is my purpose? Why am I here? He says, seek first the kingdom of God, and you've been doing that. Keep doing that. And ask me, because I want to form and reshape, and I may not give you the whole picture, but I'm going to give you glimpses. In fact, it's hidden in your history. Go back and look, and then Let's continue to clean up your lenses and your vision so you can see where we're going. That's your destiny. That's what I had in mind when I put you in your mother's room. And by the way, you got to do it in community. You can't do it all by yourself. Well, that makes it harder. Yep, for sure. For sure. Craig Rochelle wrote a book called Cazone. And he defines the word this way that I think is appropriate for today. Kazon is the Hebrew word for the, for the dream, revelation, or vision God was thinking about when he made you. You're a one of a kind, placed on earth with a plan that's yours alone to carry out. God isn't hiding it. He wants you to know and embrace it. Now, there is always a cost to living on purpose. I mentioned that. But it is worth it every time. Paul, he was shipwrecked left for dead, but can I tell you something? He had purpose, and he was on assignment because he was doing the thing that God called him to do. You have a unique grace on your life, as do I, to do the thing that God has called you to do. And if you're not there yet, and by the way, that's a whole nother message. Is there a there, or is it who we're becoming? He is the reward, Who am I becoming in the process? Where are we going, Jesus? Just give me another step. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, and he will direct our paths. I want the whole staircase. No way. I'm giving you a step. That's how I work. Because if not, you're going to take off without me. I need you to take a step. Luke 9, 23. He said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. And follow me. God, help my unbelief. God, help me to trust you when I don't know where to go. God, help me when I'm overwhelmed with, it, with all the responsibilities of life. Take up your cross daily and choose me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to direct your path. Paul later wrote to the Galatian church, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. We don't graduate faith. Ever. We keep stepping, church. Because here's what I know. He's faithful. And he loves us so much. He's willing to chase you down and speak to your heart. As he did, he found me on some random island in the middle of the Caribbean. And sent a random person. To remind me he had a plan. He does for you too. Redemption is available to all of us, but we're going to have to make some choices. 
along this path. We're going to have to choose the way of obedience versus disobedience and going our own way. Rebellion is at the heart of sin. (laughs) And we're going to have to grow up as God's sons and daughters to say, yes, God, though you slay me, I will trust you. That is what Job, who lost everything in the Old Testament, said. He's calling us to a higher level because he knows that he's got good, good plans for us, church. The way of freedom. we got to choose freedom. God, continue to do the hard work. This hurts. Oh, yes, but it's going to get good. I promise. And the way of God's purpose, rather than trying to figure it out on our own, that's stressful. Let's just keep stepping. Let's get really good at taking good steps on the staircase. And then the plan will get revealed.